So thank you for coming to the talk. Um, this is about disassembling and decompiling Scala code. Um, about myself, I work for IBM in the Watson and cloud uh, analytics platform, particularly focusing on weather-based analytics. So the data that we ingest is all uh, weather-based data, and then we repackage our analytics uh, as a B2B product and sometimes a B2C product. Um, I've been with IBM for about a year, a uh, little over a year now. Uh, and prior to that, I was in the life sciences. And when I came to IBM, uh, it was a little bit, it was definitely a different industry, but it was a little bit different uh, culture in terms of software development. And part of that uh, involved having legacy Java applications, as well as working in an agile manner. Uh, we follow scrum practices. So we had particular technology challenges as well as business challenges when it came to uh, introducing Scala code. So the motivation for this talk is primarily how do we turn Java developers into Scala developers, and how do we repackage our Scala applications in a team environment so that we can have a uh, common set of infrastructure that runs multiple types of applications. Part of this means running modern Scala applications alongside legacy Java applications. I think the, the oldest Java application I've seen is uh, developed against 1.4 code. Uh, so it's about a 10-year-old Java application running in Tomcat uh, that needs to sit alongside a Scala uh, 2.12 application. So there's shared resources, shared constraints, um, sometimes we deploy these in EC2, so we have um, an infrastructure problem as well. So in addition to teaching Java developers how to be good Scala developers, we also need to establish like best practices. How do we style our Scala code so that it's effective, so that it's readable? Um, and then how do we do debugging? So another way to say this is we want to turn uh, Scala features and Java features into like compatible paradigms. And we want to look at how the bytecode works in order to understand how Scala at runtime is Java. Right? This is part of uh, the Scala community that sometimes gets ignored or a little bit um, neglected that when we compile our Scala code, it turns into a dot class file, gets packaged into a jar, and therefore at runtime, it is Java code. So how many people here are Java developers as well? Okay, good. So I'm gonna talk a lot about Java as well, so um, I'm gonna stop a couple times and we can have questions and Q&A if, you know, if you guys need that. Um, we're gonna go through just a bunch of examples, so we'll go through as many as we can. Um, in order to understand how the Scala compiler works, we can kind of reverse engineer the dot class files that come out. And we can do that using the Scala P, which is the Scala profiler, the Java profiler, and any decompiler. So I picked JDCMD just because it has a nice command line interface. Uh, there's JD GUI, which has a little browser you can use, uh, as well as all the Scalac commands. So um, I encourage you to read through the documentation about Scalac and the different options for print, and that will go through the entire list of um, compiler options. So let's start with Hello World, right? The simplest example. Uh, in the first box is just source code, right? So I have object main and just a print line statement, right? Hello World. When I look at the Scala P output, uh, it's exactly what I would expect. I have object main, it extends any ref. There's the constructor for it, and then the main, the main method. When I use the Java profiler, it's also exactly what I would expect. And now I can see, oh, okay, the Scala profiler and the Java profiler, how they, how they work to decompile, not decompile, how to deconstruct that dot class file in terms of method signatures. The next more complex example would be a bean, right? So, 
if I need to make my Scala code compatible with JSR 303 and 349. Um, you would commonly see the at bean property annotation uh, put onto constructor parameters. And in this case, I have specified them as vars in order to actually be uh, bean compliant so that I would get getters and setters named appropriately. But you'll see it's not actually technically a POJO. And that comes from the Scala compiler understanding that I've put the at bean property. And so yes, it does insert the get age and set age methods, but it also retains the Scala uh, age and um, the age getter and age setter. So you'll notice there are two different setters for age and name as well. So technically it's not JSR 303 compatible, but because um, it does adhere to like the basic bean spec, you can run this like in Tomcat or Jetty. So another Scala feature that I really like are, is case classes. And if I take off the at bean property and I say, well, you know, this is my bean person. I really want different types of people. I'm gonna have users, I'm gonna have uh, maybe students, I'm gonna have uh, Scala days attendees, I'm gonna have different types of people that I want to be able to pattern match on. Okay. I take off the at bean property, I put on a case, and then I can do, all, do my pattern matching. Well, what, what is all this other code that gets put out by the compiler? I have product arity, I have product element, um, I'm overriding product iterator. There's, there's all this extra code that I get just by having a case class. Uh, and it's not just in one class, it makes a companion object uh, for overriding two string, for, having, for making it functional with apply. So I get all this extra stuff. And that does enable pattern matching and, and, and some of these other features that Scala offers. But there is an inherent downside, which is that I'm uh, potentially polluting my permgen memory at runtime. So does everybody know what permgen memory is? Is that anyone? So, so perm, perm gen memory is a, it's basically namespace allocated memory at runtime um, used by Jetty or Tomcat or anything that needs to retain uh, references to methods. So by doing this, um, yes, it's nice for me as a developer to have really clean case classes and then be able to filter on them or, or map my case classes accordingly, but I could potentially have a runtime problem. So one of the other things that I love about Scala is that I can have default parameters. So if, this is an actual example from an application I made, worker CLI config. It has um, a to date and a from date. And then I want to lazy load those into uh, an offset date time. When I use the Scala profiler, it does a pretty good job. OK, I, I, it's exactly what I would expect. I have my vowels. But how, how do I do this in Java? What's actually going to get run? Because Java does not have default values. So this, this is the first and simplest example I could think of where there's a Scala feature that doesn't naturally map over to Java. So if I use the Java profiler on this, what would I expect to get? Uh, okay, so some of it is, is pretty straightforward. I have a from and a to and a UUID method uh, just for my input parameters. But in red here, I have um, public static and then a bunch of strings with, uh, this is just the output of, of the profiler, less and greater, but I have defaults one, two, three, four, five. And the types match accordingly over uh, to the Scala uh, types for what's coming into the constructor there. So that's interesting. That's how 
the compiler handles default arguments. It sets it as a public static. Notice it's not final. So technically, it's overridable. But I found that to be an interesting example. We'll come back to this in a little bit to talk about the lazy aspect of that. How does lazy work? So I guess the big lessons for just using the profiler would be that uh, Scala code and Java code can be considerably different. Um, sometimes it can be JSR compliant, sometimes not, and that takes kind of a careful consideration for what kind of code you're writing. Are you gonna be dropping this into a web server? Are you gonna be running this as a standalone application? So I guess my like lessons learned would be that you need to consider the runtime consequence of the code you're writing and not necessarily write Scala code for you, the developer. Sometimes I want to mix and match my Java and Scala code, uh, which can be great at times, but it can be terrible at times. And knowing how each of the respective compilers makes compliant bytecode is kind of important. Um, a good example would be like enums. An enum in Java is a lot different than an enum in Scala. And sometimes I want a Java enum. Say I'm using like an ORM and I want to have an easy mapping. I have legacy hibernate or something. So I'm gonna inherit this Java enum. That's fine. Maybe that is what I want. Maybe I want to port that over to a Scala enum for different reasons. So understanding the difference between not just language features, but the compiler and then the runtime consequence I think is very important, um, as well as making good, readable, shareable code. Are there any questions so far? I think I said a lot of buzzwords, a lot of Java stuff. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, well, the profiler is great, but that only tells me the methods, uh, the public variables. It doesn't actually show me what's in the code. So let's go through a few examples about the decompiler, and then we can actually see what's going on under the hood. So let's go back to my bean person. Uh, when I run the decompiler, I, I get this massive at Scala signature annotation on the top of that. What, like, what is that? So when I started decompiling Scala code, this was the first thing that jumped at me. I don't normally see this in Java code. What, what is going on here? And the Scala compiler puts on this annotation, uh, which is a byte array representation of the class itself. And it's a very slick way to do things like Scala reflection. Uh, it's kind of 15, I think the statistic I read was 15 times more performant than actually scanning the class itself. And because you can just stream the byte stream um, at runtime, you don't have to do it like multiple times. You can cache it, you can do all sorts of cool stuff that I believe tools like Spark do when they're serializing classes back and forth. So the rest of the examples, I basically just chop this off for this real estate sake. How do companions work? Well, as we can see, the constant is represented in a companion class, which gets annotated with the, with the dollar sign symbol. So all of the actual logic of this val constant uh, is represented in a secondary class that gets generated with the same name, but then you get this dollar sign suffix attached to it. In the dot class file called class with companion, we basically just have our method signatures, and that's it. All the actual construction logic, all the values are in the secondary class that gets generated. So this is my favorite example of the whole presentation. On the left, uh, upper left box is Scala code, where I have a trait of type TNR, 
and I'm going to have just a simple function, say convert, that consumes a T, produces an R. And then my simple little class is even, uh, consumes an int, produces a Boolean. If mod two equals zero, then it's true. In Java, I can have the exact same code. I have an interface instead of a trait with one method, convert, uh, and I have the same logic implemented uh, in a simple little class. But when I decompile the dot class file that gets put out, it's considerably different. So in the bottom left is, is the output of the Scala code, the bottom right is the Java code, but you'll notice the types of the implemented converter are different. Scala generates object object, and Java retains integer and Boolean. Well, that's very interesting. So Scala actually has just decided to ignore my types, which I did not expect. But there is actually a good reason for this, which is if you look at the input of convert, it's a primitive int versus Java, it's a capital integer. Now this is kind of expected because an int in Scala is, is actually a primitive in Java. So that is somewhat expected. And also in Java, I can't have an interface of type int. It has to be a capital object representation integer. So that is somewhat expected, but it means although semantically in code these are the same thing, the actual runtime is gonna be different. And there's an inherent trade-off in this because if then I'm coding against a primitive int like in Scala, I'm gonna get a compile time error if I try to pass in a null. But in Java, that would pass just fine because it's an object. So then I would hit a runtime exception when I do my uh, input.int value. So even though semantically this would be the same, I as a developer should be aware that I'm making a trade-off. Do I want runtime exceptions or compile time exceptions? And for me, usually I want compile time exceptions, catch all those things up front, uh, especially given that I may, have implement, I may have written the converter interface, but someone else is going to be implementing the is even function that I may be calling. I may not know what's on the other side of that function call. So I'll get a runtime exception. I won't know why it happened. So I prefer just catching everything at compile time. So let's go back to that worker CLI config. Uh, there, there were some lazy values in there. How does lazy actually work? Which is one of the best features that enables a lot of really cool Scala frameworks to, to function as they do. If you decompile anything that has lazy in it, you will find that there are three things generated. One is a volatile byte. And that's basically just a Boolean. You'll also see that there's a, in this case it's from, because I had a lazy value called from, and it's a date time. So that's my getter. But then I also have a private function called from lazy compute. And in this generated function is where all of the lazy initialization happens. So in the public getter, first we have a ternary expression where it does a logical check for is that byte field instantiated or not. If it is not, then execute the lazy compute function. So we jump into that, and then we hit a synchronized block. So we're locking on this object. And this is important because it is possible that multiple threads are trying to execute this piece of code, and you, don't, you want to ensure that only one instance ever gets created. So instead of implementing only a singleton check, it does a double locking mechanism on the object. So once the lock has been achieved, you're in the synchronized block. But then it does a 
another check against that volatile variable. Why would it do this? It's because, theoretically, you could have multiple threads trying to instantiate this. One has hit the lock, but has not released it yet. So you actually do get two uh, threads competing for uh, that volatile variable. So you need to do a double check to make sure that two threads cannot instantiate the same object twice. So this is a thread safe example of what the compiler can do for you. So just by ha having something be lazy loaded, you're automatically guaranteed that's thread safe. I found that to be really cool. Yes? So you want to check it first in order to know which, should I just return it or should I lazy load it? The, uh, that is a typo. Yep. <laughs> so tail recursion is probably the most um, advanced Scala feature that we'll talk about here. So this is just an example of a simple tail recursion function um, that computes the sum of a bunch of numbers. And when you decompile it, you get very complex code here. But the main point is that it's an infinite for loop with break conditions. So what does that tail recursion do? Why, why do I annotate my inner function here with that tail recursion? Uh, it's basically a flag to the compiler uh, to try to optimize that. I don't actually have to use at tail recursion. The compiler will produce a, a reasonable piece of code. Uh, unless I actually write bad code, it can't always turn something that is seemingly recursive into uh, runnable code. So this is an example where I have annotated it with that tail recursion, so it's going to try to optimize it. But because it's not effectively tail recursive, I'm just calling the same thing multiple times, the compiler is going to throw an exception and say, I can't do that. So there are three different cases for recursive function calls. One would be something that can be optimized. One is something that uh, is not compilable. And the third is the classic example of you're going to get a stack overflow. So the lessons I have from uh, doing decompilation on that dot class files would be that, that lazy eval is thread safe. It's a great feature, and you should use it um, all the time. I would say that knowing that runtime versus compile time exceptions are very important. And personally, I would advocate for compile time checks more than runtime checks. Um, conversely, I love Python as well, so you know, what do I know? Uh, but I would also say pay attention to um, all the different output files. So, when you do companion objects, when you do um, nested multiple, um, multiple classes in the same file, you're going to generate a lot of namespace. And so knowing how that gets executed at runtime is an important consideration. Uh, so how, what does the compiler do in order to generate any of this code? Well, here, here's all the different phases that it goes through. And I would say using the scalac-x print function or command, you can execute any one of these, and it will give you very awesome output in terms of what the compiler is actually doing. So it, it starts just by scanning the classes. I'm also assuming here that any Java code has been compiled first. It gets a little more complicated if you're trying to do mixed compilation uh, or Scala compilation than Java compilation. But the ones that I pay attention to would be the initialization phase. I look at the analyze phase. 
Uh, the uncurry and the lambda lift, the output is very verbose, so unless you're a super awesome Scala developer, um, I would kind of skip those. But then look at the types, values, options, because that's doing all the conversion from Scala code into Java types. Uh, so future examples that I would say, I encourage you to go home and try for yourself, would be uh, traits with methods, uh, classes extending multiple traits, and of course, implicits. And as Martin talked about in his keynote, implicits are probably the defining feature of Scala, um, but they are very deep and very cool and outside the scope of today. Um, as well as annotations, because annotations can be uh, retained at runtime, they can be ignored, so playing with those is also, also worth doing. And the one thing that I did not test that I probably should have would be using multiple uh, Java and Scala compilers. So I was using Java 1.8 for this and Scala 2.11. It probably is a worthwhile exercise to try to target, say, Java 1.5 runtime and then decompile that and see what happens. Or if, if you're brave, go back to like 1.3 or 1.4 before generics existed, uh, before autoboxing existed, and see what happens. Uh, so the question really is, how do I build a good application out of this? That's the whole motivation for us talk. Um, at IBM, we have legacy infrastructure, we have new infrastructure, and how do we try to marry them together? So some of the things we have would be S3, Cassandra, we have Spring applications, sometimes we deploy them into Tomcat, sometimes we're running Spark applications. So my, um, my goal would be to try to marry as many of these technologies as possible, but in a reasonable way. So the code that I write and that my team writes tries to be very flexible and extensible, as well as encapsulate any uh, specific logic or any specific syntax so that our APIs are very straightforward, but internally we can have all the cool functional programming that we want. But to the outside Java developer, uh, it'll appear just like normal Java-ish Scala code. Are there any questions? So here, here are my references. I borrowed a lot of this um, from the Alexander book and website, uh, as well as a couple of uh, online discussions and that's it. Any questions overall? Yes. I noticed that the uh, types in the converter example were sort of erased and then it generated an interface from object to object. Mm -hmm. um, when that file is loaded as a library into, into some other project for compilation, Scala still has to perform type checks on it. Does it do that with the annotation, the, the byte stream? Yes, it does it with the byte stream. That's where the information is retained. Um, a lot of the runtime of dot class files, of, of effectively Java code, uh, ignores types altogether. So um, you can do a lot of things with reflection that kind of cheat the typing system. So it's nice that that byte stream retains that. Would anything have changed if the Java class had have extended the Scala trait instead of the Java interface? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. And might you have any advice for mixed code bases in general, like kind of best practices to follow if you're mixing a lot of Java and Scala? Yep. So, so I mix a lot of my Java and Scala together, but it tends to be more uh, Java code getting imported into the Scala code base. I have found it to be a little bit dangerous to go the other route, primarily because of packages and namespaces. Um, that being said, you, you can definitely do it, um, but my personal advice would be to use all the Java features that you want in your Scala code and not the other way around. Yes? Uh, d does the erasure of the types in the generated interface for the trait imply that Java code, which calls Scala code, can't take advantage of that typing information? Uh, it, it can take advantage of that, uh, depending on how you've structured your code. 
Um, the, the type information can be retained depending on which, um, which compiler you're using and how you've kind of structured it, but you, can't, you can take advantage of that. I've noticed that Dmitry is not here. He would probably say about the lazy vowels. Um, so because they, uh, like if you have several, and the first one like takes five minutes to initialize, and the second one is, takes like two seconds, mm -hmm. and they lock on the same mutex, if you touch the first one, the second one is gonna wait for five minutes until the first one. So in Doty, they removed it, and like if you want it to be uh, thread safe, you have to tell it to be thread safe. So by default, it's not. Yes. Which is kind of. Well, it, it's thread safe on obtaining that particular lock, right? Overall, obtain, initializing all the values, it is not thread safe. That's true. Um, so in the example you showed with the default values, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that they were not final, do you know why they're not? Is that? Uh, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, that is simply the output of the compiler. I have not dug into the compiler source code to find out why. Okay, thank you.